When it comes to people talking about the worst games of 2015, I've noticed an awful lot of AAA games pop up on their list. It's understandable, of course. We did certainly have a unique year in gaming that led to some very high highs and some very low lows. The thing is, people can't always afford those big budget games, which means we have developers throwing games out left and right, hoping they'll get exposure. This leads to some mixed results, and as I waded through my games this past year, I often found myself entrenched in a bog of mediocrity. Much to my own dismay. I've made a list of 10 games that sucked me down deeper into the mud, threatening to consume my sanity completely. Let's begin, shall we? Tormentum Dark Sorrow is a game that I reviewed positively, something that I thoroughly regret now. It's not a game that doesn't have its own merits, of course. The artwork in the game is macabrely beautiful, the soundtrack haunting, the story is somewhat thought-provoking, and it's almost a textbook example of a game that I'd love. Unfortunately, the game falls flat due to its writing, which might as well be a capital offense in a story-based game. The biggest problem was the game's philosophy fell completely flat. It was using Immanuel Kant's second categorical imperative. Act in such a way you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never merely as a means to an end, but always at the same time as an end. This roughly comes down to never treat someone as a pawn or as a means to an end, as a backdrop for the morality and the choices you make throughout the game. It does provoke questions about morality, and at points the writing is solid, but the ending ultimately goes against everything the game tries to teach you. I rated this game as high as I did in my original review because I knew not everyone would be as critical as I was about the philosophy, and they may actually get something out of it, learn to question it, and have an intellectual discussion. I actually would like more thought-provoking games like Tormentum out there, but the game's writing ultimately condemns it to the depths of the bog. Disappointing sequels seem to be a trend with lists like these, and Finding Teddy 2 is no exception to this rule. Finding Teddy 1 was originally a mobile point-and-click adventure game. This game is one that borrows tons of ideas from things like Castlevania, Metroid, Legend of Zelda 2, but it almost never makes itself stand out from those games. It was like they just went, let's just throw all these games together and see what happens. There are some unique things, like the singing mechanic that our heroine uses to communicate with the other denizens of the world, but that wasn't enough. When you're exploring the world, you're not exploring a living world, you're exploring boxes with random enemies floating around. The game doesn't know how to convey what it wants you to do or where it wants you to go. The only thing it really does is say, your teddy bear is gone, go get it, gives the little girl a sword and a shield and just sends you on your way. Even classic Zelda games did better than this, giving you more stakes and telling you a story with little to no dialogue. Finding Teddy 2, on the other hand, does not. The combat tries to emulate those classic games as well, but you're never under any real threat, so any sense of accomplishment of beating an enemy is lost. You can just hack at enemies for hours until they just fall over, with no real strategy on just how you attack or what you attack with. Don't play this game if you want to relive Zelda 2 or Castlevania. There are many other Metroidvania games out there you can choose from. Don't let this be one of them. Ocieri is one of the few games I managed to get away with not giving it any sort of number rating because it is such an enigma to me. It was mostly well written, the imagery and atmosphere of the game corresponds with the story that was being told, but the gameplay is, quite frankly, very obtuse. There are puzzles in this game that you will need a pencil to write down, and while that sounds great for older gamers, this game goes about it in the most unenjoyable way. It makes even those who enjoy moon logic from adventure games past to scratch their head in utter confusion. Every puzzle is tedious and mind-numbing to complete, the game screen moves with you while you play, giving you this sickening feeling, especially with the stark contrast of colors, and it just drags on for far too long. It's like being on a cruise ship stuck in the mud in the middle of the Sahara Desert. It's just not as engaging as it should have been. If I only judged games on story, Osiri would have been fine, but since I try to look at the entire picture, I can't in good conscience recommend this game to anyone. If it was something akin to a visual novel or an entirely narrative-based game without any puzzles whatsoever, I could, but in this case, I can't. I hope the creators of this game keep writing, because this game has some top-notch, thought-provoking stuff in it, but I'm also hoping that they learn to make games as well. If there was one game I did not want to put on this list, it was Animal Gods. I followed it closely during its Kickstarter, I was given a preview build, and I told the devs what they should try to fix before it was released. Unfortunately, it appears that my words fell upon deaf ears. It needs decent gameplay, but oh sweet Christmas is it atrocious. Each level gives you a different challenge, sword fighting, bow and arrow, and teleporting to a safe area, and they're all so bad! The swordplay takes far too long to kill anything, and unless you step directly in the path of the monsters, you're not gonna die. Same goes for the bow, except it takes slightly longer because the enemies move more. Just spam the attack button and you win! Congratulations! Don't you feel so accomplished by slamming your keyboard over and over and over again? To top it off, every single enemy you face is a damage sponge, so you'll have to hit it a few times, watch it run away to an area you can't attack, and wait until it comes back. 
the boss fights make you do the exact same thing again, but with more enemies. The teleporting aspect of the game thrust the idea of perfect platforming on you where it hadn't been previously, and not the rewarding kind where you felt like you actually accomplished something. Oh no, if you breathe wrong during these sequences, you will die and have to go all the way back to the last checkpoint. The worst thing is, it isn't always your fault either. You're slipping and sliding all over the place to the point where you might accidentally step on the invisible hitbox for the death lines. Sometimes you can step almost right on top of them and nothing happens, and then sometimes you brush by it with your cloak and you die immediately. This game is unfinished and I don't know why they put it out in the state they did, but I do hope they fix these issues in their future games. Terror Blaster is a game about shooting things, trying to achieve a high score, and memes. If you are wondering why I didn't start this out more eloquently like I did in previous entries, it is because that this game has so little content it does not deserve it. It starts you off with music so loud that I pity anyone who used headphones to play this game the first time. The ship you control goes from moving blindingly fast to being sluggish and unresponsive. You can just spin the ship around in circles and shoot things and you'll actually get fairly far in the game. And finally, when you die, it quotes a random movie, meme, or joke at you that makes no sense in context. It tries to emulate Asteroids, but doesn't provide any of the unique charm that made it the classic that it was. I know this game is only $1.49 on Steam, but that doesn't excuse how poorly executed what should have been a simple concept. Don't waste your money on this, however cheap it might be, it's not worth it. A mobile game having problems transitioning to the PC isn't anything new, but it's a shame to see Mimpy, a cute little mobile game, to have so many problems. It's a fun concept, a dog dreams about crazy things in the middle of the night, and you adventure through those dreams. Mimpy didn't make the transition to PC gaming very well. In fact, you could say that the game is unresponsive and unplayable at times. It quickly becomes apparent that nobody playtested this game before it made the transition, because there are a lot of things that are better suited for a touchscreen rather than a mouse. If you use a controller, you need to practically mash it in order to get it moving. If you use a mouse, you need to be careful on how fast you move, because sometimes you might go rocketing into the side to your death. The game has a unique art style, and you can tell it has a lot of heart behind it, but there's no excuse for it to play this poorly, PC port or no. What's sad is that the mobile version is actually quite fun, and it shows just how little effort was put into the PC port. If you want to play Mimpy, play it on your tablet, but stay away from the PC release. Horror games have been flooding the market as of late, and while it's nice to see a resurgence in the genre, I might be more reluctant to see it if games like Sylvia are what's going to come out of it. Some parts of it, like communicating with ghosts, works very well, while other parts, like fighting ghosts with a screw gun, just doesn't work. Silvio tries to build itself up like this atmospheric horror game with a rich, interesting world, and then it makes you shoot a blob with a screw gun or jump across platforms in order to get something. Sometimes the best mechanic in the game, the ghost listening mechanic, can lead you to your death because the hitbox on the blob isn't defined, so it could be in the next room and it just kills you out of nowhere while the microphone is telling you that it's still 30 feet away. Or you have to deal with the clumsy platforming mechanic that makes you jump around in an abandoned amusement park. Its save points are also so heavily spaced out that it becomes even more frustrating when you are killed by seemingly nothing and you have to go all the way back to the beginning. Silvio is just an unfinished game that tries too hard to be serious when it's asking you to shoot potatoes at shadows on the wall. On paper, the Weaponographist seems like a slam dunk of a game due to its similarities with The Binding of Isaac. Problem is, while the creativity is definitely reminiscent of The Binding of Isaac, it doesn't have any of the gameplay that makes that game work so well. Playing the Weaponographist is similar to your first time ice skating. You slide haphazardly across the ice and hope you don't collide into someone that will kill you. What makes matters worse is that your character, Doug McGrave, is using weapons, so not only do you have to fight against the slip and slide controls, but you have to mash the attack button wildly as you do so, hoping you'll land some form of damage on the swarms of enemies who seem to be very well adapted to the ice scapes that they live in. It has tons of referential jokes, too, that just get grating. It's like you're watching one of the epic movies on repeat and there's no way you can turn it off. You're listening to the same jokes, fighting the same controls, collecting the same currency, stuck in the same environments over and over again, with barely any variation. It's like the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That's what the Weaponographist is. You know, if you told me at the beginning of the Red Goddess Inner Worlds Kickstarter that they would have released a terrible, unresponsive, boring, poorly written, horribly marketed, and buggy piece of bog mud, I wouldn't have believed you. I would have said, it can't be that bad. Then I played the demo, which barely worked, and I tentatively thought, well, it'll get better. I was so wrong. The art is great and inspired, but just everything else just doesn't work for the PC release. 
The game crashes constantly on multiple computers, it has frame rate issues, the narrator is not implemented well, and he becomes annoying very quickly. The combat and the movement controls are akin to wearing concrete shoes while trying to perform somersaults, the graphics are so scaled back that it makes the map nearly unreadable, and sometimes you have to slam your fingers down on the controller or mouse in order to get it to work. I was told that the PS4 release was better, and that's fine, but the PC version is still a steaming pile of carrion roasting in the sun. If you're gonna release something on more than one platform, all of your releases should be at the very least stable. The Last Dogma. That game's name alone should tell you what sort of trouble you're getting into when you decide to play it. Or in my case, when a mysterious developer finds my personal email address and asks me to review this game. While unsettled by this, I did agree, since I didn't have anything on my schedule to review or write about. What I was rewarded with was by far the worst game I had ever played. The game introduces itself with a mind-numbingly long, yet skippable, cutscene telling you of the game's story, and you are given a note happily telling you that The Last Dogma has a complex story. And if you don't understand it, have no fear, the developer has a Steam discussion page just for you. The page has since been taken down and can be found on the developer's blog, but it gives an explanation of the game. The game claims to be a black comedy and a social satire, all while throwing Christian cannibalistic cults in there with demons that claim to be controlling you and a terrible time travel storyline that runs amok throughout the whole game. Most of the cutscenes, and I use that term loosely, are comic book pages that you flip through individually and it just rips you right out of the game. It tries to emulate classic horror adventure games, but the story does not reflect that. It's actually funnier than anything else. You have a gun, but you don't use it until you're halfway through the game, where you're treated to people dying in over-the-top explosions of blood. What was the point of even giving us a gun when every single human being just absorbs all the bullets till the end of the game? It also decides to give you a fake blue screen of death, adding insult to injury considering just how many times this game will crash. The story tries to be deep and meaningful, but it's like the developer just took a bunch of different ideas and threw them all in a blender, hoping to get something worthwhile, but it turns out to be a complete and utter mess. Surprise, surprise. There's no consistency in the storytelling, and it just goes all over the place to the point where telling you about it in depth would drive me to absolute madness. In fact, this is the only game on the list where I just left it running while I walked away from my computer and outside to watch the rain fall from the beautiful gray sky, hoping it would give me some sort of answer to who thought this game was a good idea. To make it better, The Last Dogma is the only game where I've had my screenshots banned from Steam because they were considered inappropriate. Wanna know what they were? Here they are. I wasn't allowed to post certain things after this happened, and while I've gotten those privileges back, I'm still fighting Steam to get those screenshots back up. The Last Dogma isn't just bad, it's atrocious. It tries to be an intellectual game, snubbing all of those who don't understand it, but guess what? People don't understand it because the game is so mind-numbingly bad that you could have just written your precious story out on a wall of a local grocery store, and it would have had the same exact effect that this game did. 2015 wasn't a bad year for gaming, with games like Bloodborne, Life is Strange, Stasis, and Dropsy all being released in the same year. However, they make games like the ones I mentioned stand out all the more. You're welcome to play the games on the list, but I wouldn't recommend it. There are far better games out there, maybe some you haven't heard of. So take a chance and go for it, or maybe wait until my next video where I talk about some great games from 2015.